is a panel about finding your filmmaking voice through YouTube. So um, if that's what you're here for, then you're in the right place. Uh, my name is Joel Marshall, and I'm going to bring some uh, other folks up here on the stage uh, to help me out, help me talk about this. We're waiting still on one person. His name is Seth Word. I don't know, have you any, any of you heard of Seth Word? We're going to hear about him today, I'll tell you, because <laughs> it's going to be super fun. Um, okay, so... So my first guest is somebody that I've known, I don't know, 20 years, 20 years. Ivan Hemmins. Ivan Hemmins is, hey Ivan, you see him up on the screen here. I'm going to play his video just so you get an idea of like what he's doing. This is his YouTube channel here. Um, let's take it. Analytics on my most popular video. Okay, well, along the way, I'll share what I've... In this video, I'll share how my channel has grown, some of the milestones it's crossed, and take you into YouTube Studio to show you the analytics on my most popular videos. Along the way, I'll share what I've learned about YouTube and offer a few things to consider if you decide to start your own YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Okay, so everybody subscribe to Hey Ivan and welcome Ivan Hemmings. Hey guys. Can you all hear us just this way? This is right. Okay. Great. I'm so glad I didn't wear that same shirt. I almost did. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Ivan, can you tell us a little bit about um, how you came to grow, uh, making a YouTube channel? Okay. So, uh, for those, well, he knows. Yeah. I've been uh, fascinated by technology for a bajillion years, way back before there was this thing called the internet. And uh, I pursued education with uh, computer science and all kinds of technology stuff. And when I finally stopped going to school and I needed a job, I, I found my way to a law firm and into their IT department. So I've been working at a company doing IT for years and I've been the family, I don't know if any of you guys ever do this. Your family comes to you and they're like, hey, I just trying to figure out this thing on my phone or my VCR is blinking. So I'm the guy for my family. And I found a job that allowed me to pursue that. And so that's what I've been doing for the last 24 years. But during this whole pandemic time, I kind of started reevaluating, like, you know, I'm answering these questions all the time anyway, and I'm not really getting to see my friends as much, but they're still asking, and we're either doing Zoom sessions or whatever. It, it might be a good idea if I just create a channel so I can have a home for the answers that I'm giving all the time anyway. A lot of the, there's overlap between what I answer at work and what I answer for friends and family, but I find regular people uh, that, that aren't specializing in a particular thing. They, they care more about stuff like, you know, how do I get these pictures off of my phone, uh, off my old phone and onto my new phone, stuff like that. So those are the kinds of things that I do. The whole premise of my channel is you ask a tech question, I'll do a little research and I'll create a video answer. And uh, I found out that Joel had also created a channel. And uh, I learned that another friend of mine that I used to work with years ago, she started a channel like six years ago. And when she told me that, um, you know, not only was she having the most fun that she's ever had, sort of telling stories to people uh, online and just being herself in front of the camera, but she was making at least as much money as she was making when she used to work at my job, uh, which I was like, really? Hmm. Six years? I could do that for six years. I mean, I'm already answering the questions anyway. So that's, yeah, that's kind of what, what happened. Who in here has YouTube channels? Yes. Two? Two people? All right, cool. Uh, Patrick, what's your YouTube channel? Uh, it's my name, John yeah. Patrick Daly. It uh, has all of my actual comedy sketches. Yeah. Nice. And what, what is your YouTube channel? It's just creative channels. And what is what do you have on yours? This stuff that I've created. You yeah. know, we do a lot of traveling, and so I, I do videos, little short videos of some of the places we go to. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I try to keep them short. That's cool. And, um, what do you do, Ivan, to get viewers to your channel? Like, are you, do you study analytics or do anything like that? Yeah, so, um, so I've been doing my, my channel. This coming, I guess, on the 17th of this month will be two years since I started my channel. And I've uploaded, uh, the first year I uploaded one video every single week. And this year I've been kind of hitting about every other week just because things are opening up and more things are happening on the weekends, which is usually when I film. So I've got uh, about 80 videos that I've posted so far, and I do study the analytics. So if you have a YouTube channel, 
YouTube shows you a chart that lets you see when people start watching your video, and it's like, it's like a line graph. And so if you have a 10 minute video, it'll start at 100%, and then as people click away to go do other things, the line will go down. And so you can see for every video that you post where there are sharp declines, and then where there are spikes in interest, and that can help you figure out. This is the part where I was kind of blathering, people didn't want to hear that part, and they kind of clicked ahead to where I got into the meat of the topic, and then I started showing this really obscure thing, and people kind of clicked away on that, and then some of them skipped forward to this next part. So you can really track the performance of an individual video, and I'd say if you're starting a brand new channel, I wouldn't worry so much about that in the beginning. The thing I'd focus on the most would be trying to tell a compelling story, trying to make a good quality video, trying to cut the fat out of, out of the episode so that you're not spending 20 minutes introducing a topic that's gonna to take you a minute to explain. And um, what I learned over the first 50 videos that I did was that, hey there. Oh, that's an entrance. Shepherd, Allison. Excuse me. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. Just have a seat and I'm going to bring you up here. Yeah, Hello. so hey, that was an entrance. Excuse me. <laughs> no, that was great. Uh, so, so what I learned over the first 50 videos is that there was a part that I was introducing. Like, hey guys, welcome to my channel. I answer tech questions, blah, blah, blah. Almost everybody. Like, uh, it would go from 100% down to 60% in 30 seconds. And that told me. I didn't really need to say that part. Most people coming to my channel, they just want you to get immediately into what you're talking about. So I've eliminated that. And I've eliminated most of the, the end part where I'm like, hey guys, like and subscribe and come back for the next video. And I'll keep rambling for another tip. So really, I've, I've cut off the intro, I've cut off the outro, I leave just the, the meat. And um, it's, it's interesting, I'm still learning. I think if you're starting a channel, the thing that you probably would benefit from is identifying for yourself, even if it's just in your imagination, who are you talking to on the other side of the camera? Because the better you can connect with a person on the other end of the camera, if you're actually talking to an audience, you'll attract those kind of people to your video. In the beginning, I didn't know who I was talking to, and now that I've started to get comments and likes and, and subscribers and so on, it, it gives me a better sense of who my audience is, and that makes it easier to create videos. And it also helps, you know, because there's, there's a lot of ways you can approach answering a question like the premise of my channel. So if someone's like, what kind of new phone should I get? I'll give a different answer if I'm talking to someone who's like uh, a technology professional than, than I will if I'm talking to like my cousin or my aunt or to someone who, you know, they upgrade their phone like once every seven years. So if I, if I know in my mind who I'm talking to, then when people watch the video, they'll be able to self-select and say, oh yeah, this video's for me. And I think that'll help your channel grow. Also, if you're, if you're really focused on your topic instead of, like my, my channel is growing a little slower than some other channels because I answer kind of questions across everything. And some people are like, I'm gonna talk about Pokemon collectible cards. <coughs> and so if you focus on a specific topic, folks who are really passionate about that will come find you. But if you're a little bit of this and a little bit of that, when people watch your videos, they may not know from one video to the next whether you know every video is for them. So they may just come back and forth you know, from time to time. What do you do? What do you do about babbling? Like if you're babbling on and on and on, <laughs> how, do you con how do you contain that? Do you well, for me, I, I actually create a script for every, every video that I did. There are a couple that I've done where I didn't use a script, and with those I do heavy editing to cut out the parts where I repeat myself, and to cut out the ums and ahs. Uh -huh. But for most of my videos, I create a script, and I find that the more time I spend refining the script and making it sound, even reading it out loud to myself before I sit down to film, the better I can make that match the way that I normally speak, the more efficient I'll be in my time. So something that I could blather on for about 45 minutes, I can condense to six or seven minutes and hit all of the essential points without droning on and on. And I find the better a job I do at that, the more effective I am at communicating and, and the more views I tend to get. What about so, these things, these little shorts? Uh, you know, I experimented with those. So you guys, if you're familiar with like TikTok or Instagram Reels or whatever, they're you know, 60 second or less little tidbits. And back when I experimented with them, YouTube was trying to figure out what to do with these shorts. And so what, whenever anyone would make one to promote the use of shorts to YouTube creators, they'd kind of promote the heck out of them. So you could drop one, one 30 second video and get a thousand views in like, I know, a day or two. Mm -hmm. And they were really promoting it until they kind of locked in on what they're doing. They don't promote them as much as they used to. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a place for that. But for at my particular point in the journey, yeah. <laughs> they didn't fit because uh, you got to be high energy, you have to be entertaining, 
uh, you have to be really focused, and uh, I, I was still getting used to talking to the camera. It's much easier for me to talk to you guys here, but when I sit in front of the camera and I'm staring into the lens, I tend to um, worry about that. And, and something that I could say to you in one take might take me 10 times to get right uh, in front of a recording. So you I don't know, know why that is. I think it's just a practice thing. You didn't come at this as a performer. You nope. came at this as a teacher. Yes. Right? And how, how did it help you to be a teacher to do this kind of work? You know? Well, you know, in my professional career, I've been doing technology education stuff, speaking at seminars and panels and all mm -hmm. that stuff since 2007. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of years that I've been doing that. And it's, it's completely different when you're talking to a live audience because they can guide you mm -hmm. on what you need to spend time on. If everyone's sort of nodding off, you know, okay, I gotta jump forward. If people are engaged and they're hanging on every word, then maybe you'll spend more time talking about it. It's, it's completely different when you're sitting in front of a camera. So, uh, yeah, so for me, my, my biggest crutch is the script mm -hmm. and trying to sound natural and, and be as much myself in front of the camera. With, with my shorts, if you were to go back and watch some of them, you'll see that I seem a little bit stiff, a little bit, uh, I don't know, not polished. And I think I'll try them again probably in another six or eight months after I get another 100 videos under my belt. That's my goal. So my goal is to, to kind of look up every 100 videos and see where my channel has developed. Do you think you've grown as a person from doing this? Like, this is one of the things that this panel is about, is about like finding your voice through YouTube. And do you think this is something that's helped you find out more about who you are? Uh, yeah, I think, I think it helps a lot. It, it's, what I would say is that it's helped me to become a better communicator because it forces me to reevaluate the things that I find interesting and important and whether or not they're useful to the folks who are tuning in to the channel that I'm, you know, if you're telling a story for yourself, you're going to get gratification out of the process. But if you focus on delivering a message to your audience and you get really in touch with why you're doing that, what you're trying to share, now I think that that makes you much more effective as a presenter, as a storyteller. And so for me, that's the one thing I feel like today, if I were to start my YouTube channel over again. So today I have 775 subscribers at almost two years in. I'm, I'm confident that I could develop that big of a following in at least half the time, probably even less time than that, based on all of the things I've learned over the last two years. How do you keep your um, mind right as far as like, you have to manage your time, mm -hmm. right? So you only have so much time to put into this thing. How do you keep your momentum going? Uh, when sometimes do you feel like a tendency to like kind of slow down or like maybe run out of ideas or, or um, maybe start to doubt your channel and say like this is harder than I thought it was. <laughs> what do you? How do you combat that? And what, what it, it's harder. You? Yeah, it's harder than I thought it was because each video. For those of you who don't, well, I think most of you guys will know since you're in this. Uh, at least for me, for educational videos, it's different than what you do, right? You record essentially live. Yeah. to tape. So, so you've got a lot of time that you spend preparing. Yeah. But for me, I'm, um, I'm developing an idea into a complete answer with a beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. And so it takes me about 10 hours for every minute of content that gets up on the screen. And I'll you know, overlay like B-roll and all of that kind of stuff. To stay focused for me has been keeping a long view. Like YouTube is ultimately going to be exponential at some rate. You know, it may not be the perfect exponential. You think you're going to get state. to a place oh, yeah. where it's going to... And, and what inspires me is looking at other people that do the same thing. Yeah. Because some of them, they have huge following, but they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> I watch some of these guys and they're, you know, they're, they're talking through all of the, I I'm, I'm pay attention to technology, that's sort of my niche, right? Yeah. And I watch these guys talking, you know, they're rattling off all of the things on the side of the box, but they don't know what they're talking about. And they've got half a million subscribers. And I'm thinking, well, shoot, if they're, you know, if their people are getting value from that and these guys don't even know what they're talking about, <laughs> I feel confident that I can explain at least as well as they are, if not better, the same topic. And there is an audience out there that they prove that there's an audience out there of people that want it. So I just have to get better at my craft and it'll happen in time. And I happen to know a few people who've made it, you know, made it big in YouTube already. Mm -hmm. And you know, not, that's not the only platform, but even my own journey, I see that sometimes I don't post a video and I still get 10 or 15 subscribers over time. So it's, it's not that whether or not it's going to happen, it will happen. It's just a matter of how long it's going to take. And uh, it's, it's definitely not an overnight thing for most people. OK, we're going to bring up our next guest, um, Seth Ward. This is Seth Ward Allison. Come on up here. Thank Grab you bring your chair. I'll let you go next. Oh, yeah, just like Johnny Carson. Yeah, you go there. Oh. <laughs>
What's up, Joey? Those of you that remember John. What's up, Joey? This Hello, is, everyone. This is Seth Bird. Hello. Seth Bird is somewhat of a. Sorry, uh, I missed part of here. Oh, no, that was great. Somewhat of a nationwide sensation. This is the first time <laughs> he and I have been in the same room physically. Yeah. But we've known each other for a couple of years now through the uh, internet. It's great to see you. <laughs> so glad that you're here. I'm a big fan of this guy. Oh, I'm um, glad I catch you. I have his. I have his shirt right here. Yes. So I'll show you here. So. <laughs> yeah, that one's great. This is a shirt. On this shirt, um, Seth Rood was on America's Got Talent, and um, he has been on it more times than anybody, right? Yeah, more times I hold the anybody. world record for most fails. Most fails. <laughs> so he'll come on and he'll like be dressed as a rabbit, or he'll be dressed as a snake, or a walrus, and not only are these uh, costume characters, but they are actual characters that have motivation and are going after something, and sometimes it's they go after it so aggressively that uh, they get dragged off the stage. Like he was a rabbit, and rabbits, of course, want to populate the world with more rabbits. <laughs> so he was like, trying well, that to wasn't make. allowed in America. <laughs> that was a that was a bit in Italy that I was got. Was that in Italy? I got dragged off the stage, but that was on the Gong Show. So, I gong but show. I was just hopping. Oh, you're right. You were I just wasn't like, humping. I was hopping. <laughs> Slightly different, same yeah. intensity though. So how did you get into uh, this profession that you have, which is the most unique profession that I know of? I'm not even sure how to describe yeah, it, but the, how did you get into it? Thanks for trying. I think that, uh, yeah, what my profession is right now is a professional animal impersonator. That's what you would see on the outside, but I'm an absurdist comedian. Uh, I make movies on the side and this this thing that I've fallen into with the animal characters has been something that was brought about because I was trying to see what I could get away with on stage and that dressing up in an animal costume is sometimes the absolute easiest way to uh, to clown somebody because animals are they do whatever they want because they're animals and they get away with it so if a human puts an animal costume on all of a sudden <laughs> A human's allowed to get away with anything as we we let that person do what they're doing because they've got yeah. they're an animal. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, this is a compilation of just all the AGT stuff, yeah. but um, yeah, we did walrus, and I was trying to be a circus walrus, a peacock who lost his butt. It was very sad. That was that's very all sad. that peacocks are known for is being. Glorious. <laughs> a caterpillar who just wants to be a butterfly, but nobody wants him to. They want to keep him fat and ugly. <laughs> a giraffe with a short neck. What else is there? So many things. Yeah, and then recently there was, I was a worm. Oh yeah, so the worm. So but that's a, got drama behind it. Yeah, I don't know if you're keeping up to the, oh, I am, the Halloween I mean, drama. Yeah, so they were like, um, Simon Cowell was like sick of having him on the show, can't have him on the show anymore. So then he came on as an apple instead of an animal. So then he was doing stand-up comedy as an apple, and then out of the apple's mouth came this worm. <laughs> yeah, so I came in as a Trojan apple. <laughs> they had no idea. The judges didn't know, the producers didn't know. I was just this apple who's doing bad stand-up comedy, apple jokes. And then I burst out. I got oh, I got booed off the stage, and then I burst out as a worm. And they were like, "No!" <laughs> and they were excited, but also like, you know, I'm sure there was a lot of people. I mean, I know there's a lot of people online that hated it. They were like, "Get this! He has no talent. Why is he on a talent show?" And uh, and so I'm I'm a worm. I'm a full blown worm. And then cut to like less than five months later, Halloween happens a couple of days ago, Heidi Klum, who was a judge on AGT, dresses up in a, you know, thousands of dollars worth of costume and hours. And she, she shows up at her Halloween bash in, in New York as a worm, a, a huge worm, which is latex and like, let yes, her. there are differences in her worm costume and mine, but <laughs> the fact that she was a worm this year, not like two years later, 
It was within yeah. like half of a year she shows up and I was like, what? Didn't, didn't mention me or anything. So then I've been posting every day these like shorts that you're talking about, the yeah. like micro videos and being like, thanks for dressing up as me, Heidi. It's so awesome to be represented as the worm at your party. That's the apple. The old apple that I made. I made all these costumes. And that's the other thing. Heidi has like, you know, hundreds of people who like thousands of dollars of work on stuff. And it's just me in my garage with like limited resources and zero dollars to my name trying to make this happen. So anyway, I inspired a celebrity. I think that's so cool. They also, one of the things I wondered about was with your YouTube channel. You um, have grown this YouTube channel. Does going on America's Got Talent, does that help grow your subscribers on, on YouTube? It's weird. That's a really good question. Because I think a lot of people think that. They're like, I'm going to go on a uh, talent show or something. Or I'm going to do The Voice. Or I'm going to do American Idol. And it's gonna, I'm gonna, it'll be my big break. And for, if you're good and you're very... Uh, you bl if you're blown away, you blow them away, you make it to the finals or whatever, then yes, that is what that show does. But if you go on the show to be bad at, at something on purpose, newsflash, it doesn't get you a very large following. So it, just because I've been on that show, uh, it, the first time when I did the Caterpillar, I got way more hate mail and like a lot of nasty comment. I was a, I was called a pedophile. I was like, the worst of the worst is what I got. And then I was like, okay, uh, that was fun. I'll do it again. Uh, and and I go back on a, a second and third time. AGT doesn't doesn't tag you in any of their stuff if you are booed off stage because and I, at first I thought it was because they were mean they were like come on the least you could do is give me a tag but then I talked to the the social people and they were like it's actually a safety thing because we know how mean the internet is we don't want to give haters a direct line to the human behind the act and I was like hmm Fair enough. Like there did some people didn't need that direct line, but I'm sure I would have got. I mean, haters are innately stupid. Like they're you 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 got to be at a level of stupidity to want to push hate onto another human, or they've got problems in their own life. You know, they're dealing with things. But but in, if you're too dumb to be able to find somebody, maybe it's for the best. You don't need to find them. So if you're a you know. Maybe they saved me from some rough comments. But anyway, yeah. it was sad to not have like a boost yeah. for those who saw it and loved it, but they were too lazy to look me up. They didn't look me up. And so, and then fast forward seven times. So I've been on the show with seven wow. different animals now. I'm like, <laughs> I had the record was two or like, I had never, no one had ever been on the show who had boo been booed off the stage like before on America's Got Talent. No. Then I went on, and then I went on twice in one season, and then that shattered the record. And then ever since then, I've just been making it a thing. No one will ever come close. The show will end before somebody reaches that record. Do you? Okay, so you're a filmmaker. To start out with, you were you were a filmmaker. You still are a filmmaker. You make short films, mm -hmm. and you do things like you play a mattress. Yeah, this became like a thing that was, uh, <laughs> this became a thing with my roommates who were like, what's the worst possible Black Friday, like, scenario, and we're like, what if you get shipped, like, a vacuum cleaner, but it doesn't, it's just a naked guy, like, a vacuum parts taped to his body. No one thinks of this. Only you think of it. Well, yeah, I guess that's what we thought, and then, so that was the first one, and then yeah. we made... Then the same, guy, the same guy gets terrorized a year later with a, and he tried to order a mattress online. We just thought it's funny if everyone's done mattress shopping and they're like, I got a mattress but I, I don't like it. And they're like, oh, it's okay, you get to keep it. And they're like, I was trying to return the mattress. And they're like, oh, we don't do returns. Once you open it, we can't ship it back. And it's like, now you have a bed that you don't want. What do you do with it? So then we were like, what if there was a mattress that was sentient and also was the most annoying thing in the world? How do you get rid of a mattress? It's like, 
I mean, I live in like Hollywood where it's like packed, there's people everywhere. It's like, you don't want to throw it on the street, especially if it's like being really sad. And you're like, you don't want to sleep on me? What is wrong with you? And he's like, no, I don't want to sleep on whatever you are. You're not a mattress. He's like, I am a mattress. So then he kicks him to the curb. I don't know. I thought it was funny. It's super funny. But the thing is, yeah. these kind of videos, yeah. <laughs> crazy enough, don't get very many views. <laughs> they're, not, they're not exactly what people are like, I'm going to get on YouTube and watch a cinematic masterpiece. This is not what they choose to watch with their time. So I want to ask you that. Like, what is your goal? Like, obviously, you have made a lot of videos. YouTube that are high quality but very oh, odd. You know? Thank you for saying really so. They're really good. They're really good. And I, you know, I'm a big fan. I'm actually a Patreon, so he does. Patreon, yes. And he does live. You do live streams. And yeah, you do yeah. the shorts, and you do all these things. What is the overall goal for you? Do you want to just kind of explore your creativity and then maybe branch out, maybe make your own show, uh, and have it on like a larger scales yeah, yeah, or different yeah. is that what you want to do certainly i the bottom line is i'd love to make money doing my art form yeah. that's the that's the bottom line yeah. uh, but what i'm super passionate about is making movies making tv and i have right now i'm in the process of trying to figure out how i have a tv show that i'm developing and you've seen some of the stuff yeah, on yeah. patreon I do a lot of behind the scenes on Patreon and I'm trying to take a select group of people who are monetarily investing in this brand and this idea and we're taking them and everyone else to sell a TV show. So we've got a couple of people that are, we've got a couple of production companies right now that we're like having creative meetings and figuring out what that is. But I'm taking the failures on national television, which is like the Gong Show and AGT and then all these other like Tusica Valles and like these international shows that I've done, and taking that stupidity of this guy who thinks he's an animal will not relent even if they say stop. I'm like, animals don't know what that word is. I take that idea, that concept, and what does that look like uh, on a TV show? And so we're, we're mixing, we're mi it's like, kind of a jackass meets like Pee Wee's Playhouse, like <laughs> where we have like reality, hidden camera mixed with like this surreal world of like cartoon, puppety, yeah. costume. And I think it's got legs or hooves or whatever you want to say. <laughs> Definitely it's got legs. So we're in the process of doing that. But in the end, what I want to do is I want to make stuff that gets my friends involved, people I love and think are incredibly talented that I've always wanted to work with but never had the money to give it to them yeah. and bring them along and get to play um, on that kind of a grand scale. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, to, to move on from that, I want to bring up uh, Logan here, Logan Stubley here. So come on up, he works for Hype. Bring on And then we can talk down. a little bit more Just about like, that kind of thing. Because that, are you still doing let's the Johnny Carson? Yeah, sure, let's All do right. the Johnny Carson. Cool. <laughs> cool. So, who's, yeah. who's Johnny Carson? Exactly. <laughs> I know, when it came out of my mouth, I was like, no, no. <laughs> uh, so, you lost the use. <laughs> yeah. So Logan Stooley, he works for a company called Hype. He also does a podcast. Yes. And the podcast is called Hashtag General. General. Hashtag general. Yes. Intentionally done to make it impossible to find. Yeah, but uh, hype. It's a company we do PR, marketing, social media, and we. A lot of the work we do is actually with commercial production companies, but we've worked with short films, uh, filmmakers, uh, singers, uh, especially on the social media side. There's definitely more people interested in those services and they can get to these smaller scale things because, you know, if you're an individual, you probably don't need a press release all the time, but you definitely, if you're trying to build something, you need social media. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the things that we do as a company. And I've, even prior to Hype, a lot of my work has been in social media. I have, as I told you, I have written for um, People who have, well, not people, but organizations with over a million followers and organizations with only a few thousand. And the important thing, and that's that a lot of people don't realize, is the amount of work that goes into it is the same regardless of how many followers you have. 
and it's just with the fewer followers, you have less people working on it. So that's, a, I think, an important lesson that everyone should learn is it doesn't get easier, and you still have to work at it. So one of the things that we've been talking about, the three of us, we make content, and a lot of times we make content based on like what we would want to see and maybe how, things we want to provide people, but we aren't necessarily looking at like, this will get a million hits if I make the thumbnail this particular way. Like I right. watched this one guy that like looked at his thumbnail more than he looks at the actual video and actually makes the thumbnail first. And it's like a it's like a definite process. And it's he's not as worried about the content as as he's worried about whether this thing's going to go viral. And right. the three of us, I think the three of us generally just make things that we really like and we think people are going to like, but maybe it doesn't. Yeah, there's all into the algorithm. Yeah, there's a lot of people out there who, when it comes to either YouTube or social media, where yeah. they are overly concerned with gaming the algorithm. Mm -hmm. And yes, there are ways to growth hack, there are ways to build your audience, but something I have found in my personal and professional experience is um, it's important to be authentic, especially with YouTube. If you are inauthentic, people will eat you alive and send you hate mail. Um, or even when you are authentic, you might have <laughs> some hate mail. But beyond authentic. Beyond, yeah. The hate. Yeah, it's, if you are overly concerned with your project or your content going viral, and your whole focus is, I want this thing to be go, the thing that goes viral, every person I know who works in social media will tell you the thing that goes viral is not the thing you will think will go viral. Yeah. You have no control over what goes viral. You just have to play the game and hope something sticks. So when you are going about it from the other direction where you're just making content that you want to make to either see for yourself or just you have this urge to create, you might not get the million followers, but I think the thing, especially with you with the Patreon, I think some of the most successful creators don't necessarily have a million followers. They have a very loyal fan base that is willing to give them money, that's willing to engage with them on every platform, on every channel, because they care about that person. And yeah, you're not gonna get some company coming at you being like, hey, I wanna do an ad deal. But I, like you said, the big goal is to create and pay the bills, right? And I think that's the thing when you work. The other content. thing I think that it does, um, having a YouTube channel or having to put out regular content forces you to be creative. Like, you put your feet to the fire and say, you know what, some people say, like, I'm going to put out a video every week. Some people say I'm going to put out a video every month. But just the fact of, like, doing right. that and then actually following that makes you more creative. Wouldn't you guys agree? I mean, I think that not not, not only that, but it helps to, to improve your craft. Yeah. Because I can tell you, after doing 50 videos, the amount of time it took to produce that video uh, was less. And the, the ultimate quality of that video was significantly greater than the very first one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're forcing yourself to you sharpen the saw all the time. Well, and I think also having that yeah. content schedule. One of the things I have told people, whether it's YouTube or social, and I had to talk about both to people before. Um, I mean, your whole thing about like, oh, I might do shorts again in six months. The amount of people who don't sit there and actually think about their roadmap of content. I am honestly shocked how many people don't when that is the best way to actually gain the algorithm. It isn't to sit there and try to grab a trend. It's to make sure you're putting out content regularly. And you know what? We're all people. We all need breaks. Just because you need a break doesn't mean your content can take a break. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do anything, you need to sit there and plan for that. That might mean you record two or three episodes a week instead of right. one. You don't put them all out at the same time, but now all of a sudden you can take Christmas vacation. Yeah. And that's something I think more people need to learn, especially when they're looking at growing their platforms, social media, YouTube, wherever it is, you need to have a plan in place. Even thinking about a plan puts you in a better position than 90% of people who sit there and go, oh, I'm gonna become a YouTuber. Um, because, oh great, you're gonna be a YouTuber. What's your video in six months? And you don't have to have an answer because if you work on something that's topical, it could be whatever's big in six months. I hope you have a better answer than that. You yeah. might not, but when you create evergreen content, you should have at least some idea of where you want to be at that timeline. Otherwise, you're- I like to just 
yeah. let it inform me. And maybe I'm crazy, but well, I kind of am of the school of like, you know, where is this thing going? I'm not sure. Um, and let's find out. Right. And a lot of times that brings me into places that I never thought I'd even go. You know. Yeah, because I know the with in your case a lot of the stuff you do is live. Yeah. So you're at a disadvantage from a schedule perspective yeah. because uh, Christmas might end up on a Tuesday one year. <laughs> but, <laughs> and there I'll be. And there you'll be. But the advantage you have is yeah. you have a schedule, and yeah. if you stick to the schedule, you yeah. are. You don't need to know what you're doing in six months. You just know you're going to be broadcasting in six yeah, months. Yeah. Um, I like that. I, I, there's something I really like about that. I actually started my channel. This is my channel, just to let you know what mine is. Mine is called Lunch Therapy. I st I'm a stand-up comedian and an actor, and I started this uh, when COVID hit. I had done a podcast called Fat Free Film uh, in 2005 when podcasts where people didn't know really what they were. I was one of the first. And uh, I wanted to find out about filmmaking, and I said, I'm going to interview people about filmmaking and learn from them, and I'm going to broadcast, podcast it out to people to listen on their iPods. You have to download it to your iPod mm. at the time. And so I did about, my wife also, Kamala, and I did uh, interviews, about 80 interviews, and we interviewed like Leonard Nimoy and Patricia Arquette and uh, Peter Bogdanovich and all these people, and uh, really just learning from them, but it was such an interesting journey because I had no I had no intention to do this. Somebody came to me and said, Do you want to make a vlog? A vlog. <laughs> and I said, What's a vlog? And it's like it's like a video log or something. And I was like, okay. And so uh, we would just plunk down our camera with the lens cap on and record our conversation, you know, with Roger Corman or whoever we could come across. And the things that people said were just shocking to me. They would talk say very personal things. Because they didn't even know, like Leonard Nimoy was like, I don't know what we're doing, but let's just do it. And so he sat down in his living room and talked to him for you know, like an hour and a half or something like that. And people revealed themselves. And afterwards they would thank us because no one was interviewing people in this kind of long form uh, until this time. And they were able to look over their entire career. And so it was so, they had all these epiphanies while I was talking to them. And so I just really liked that. So when COVID hit and I had been doing stand-up in all the clubs and stuff like that, I was like, I can't stop doing stand-up because you have to keep doing it. I started doing this lunch therapy. And so today we did our 400th episode out here on the thing. I just relentlessly do the live thing Tuesdays and Fridays. And for me, it's been a real godsend because I feel like I've kind of discovered myself and who I am rather than who I'm trying to be for the industry as an actor or a comedian or anything like that. So that's been a real kind of journey for me. But maybe that's more than just trying to get um, uh, subscribers. Although everyone should like and subscribe yeah. to my channel. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and I think that that's what a lot of us go through. But also, you make such great points. So what do you think about spreading yourself too thin over many different um, platforms? There's ways to go about it. Uh -huh. um, I often tell clients and people that the best way is to take your content and find a way to remix it 18 different ways. Yeah. Um, because if you have a 10 minute long video that's on YouTube, maybe there is a two minute long section that will work on Twitter. And then maybe there's a minute long section from that that will work on Instagram. That way you're ta making one piece of content, but you're able to mix it and remix it and put it on these multiple different platforms. And when you're trying to grow your presence online, yeah. being on multiple platforms is helpful because audiences are in some ways siloed. Someone might be really into Instagram and not at all on Twitter. Someone might be really into Twitter until recently and then yeah. Yeah. not on anything else. So oftentimes what you need to do when you're trying to find an audience is you kind of just have to go to where everyone is um, and just deliver your content in a way that is good for that specific audience. And if you can do it with something you already have, a lot of the hard work has already been handled for you. Yeah. Like, I, you, you don't want to do something new every time. I, find, I don't know, Seth, do you, you put out a lot of content. Do I? Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, I, in a good way. I mean that in a good way. And you, uh, but do you, like, ever feel like you're going to burn out? 
Oh, I've burned out many times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm a phoenix, baby. I, keep <laughs> I was literally a phoenix on AGT, but yes. yes. <laughs> But yes, I, I think that burn, I think being afraid of burning out is as stupid as being afraid of dying. Like, we're all gonna die. That's the way life is. We're all gonna get sick of whatever thing we're doing. Uh -huh. And I think that being afraid of something is just uh, as silly as, as stopping yourself before you even get to it. That's really good. So I, I think finding what it is that you like about being consistent like, I started getting into like experimenting with the shorts like you're talking about uh, and comparing what it is on TikTok as shorts as on Instagram Reels because they're all literally the same. And then I started seeing like, oh, this is interesting how this worked here and this didn't. And that was interesting to me, more interesting than the work it took to get the videos up there or uploading. And then I'm pretty stubborn, so then it was like, all right, well, I'm going to do every single day no matter what. Mm -hmm. And whether that means either reposting certain videos that I edited a little bit to make it slightly different or doing a different sound or something. And then that, that fed into my not getting burned out in that. But I, I get sick of it for sure. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that you're talking about, consistency, is, that's what everybody says is that's key. And I've seen more growth being consistent than anything else. Yes, I think that's, you even live stream yourself editing. I've done that before. Yeah. It doesn't work great, but I will say, I will say, it's been the best thing that I've ever done for my TV show because. Yeah. Oh, I, hold that on, thing. bear with me because this is a crazy story. That was crazy. I st I started doing this thing where I was like, okay, well I hate editing, so I'm going to live stream while I edit as a way of if anyone wants to hang out and we'll talk while I'm editing, and if I have a question like. Does that land, that yeah. physical bit doesn't really work? What do y'all think? I started getting a lot of feedback from people online just watching me edit, which was like really fun. But it was like four or five people sometimes. Yeah. And- uh, It just has to be the right four It just has to be the right four or five people because at one point in time, I'm editing, not paying attention so much to the feed. Yeah. And I look over and Howie Mandel is like on the feed. He's like, hey, Seth Word, and I'm like editing. And I'm like, ooh. Ooh, I should have been doing something like more interesting than editing. If now he's gonna jump on my. Feed. I happened to be at work and I was online watching you edit or whatever. And then how yeah. Mandel got on. I was like, oh my god. Were you on the stream? Yeah, I was on the stream when it happened. So it was Joel, Howie Mandel, right. and another <laughs> friend of mine who's like a producer. He's like directed Jimmy Kimmel bits. Yeah, so yeah. like. He was also, I would have been like, oh, kind of embarrassed if yeah. he was the only one on. Yeah. Joel, you were on, I wasn't that embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 we hang out like, online all the time, it wasn't that big a deal. Yeah. So then he's like, yeah, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to do something with my life. And he's like, oh. <laughs> then I stopped what I was doing and pitched him my show. And then yeah. he's like, let's make it happen. And then he gives me his like number yeah, and we yeah. exchange like That's information. So, cool. so You're like, should I get off now and call him? I'm or like, what should I do? I'm like, should like, I finish the stream? I, I should finish the stream, yeah. right? <laughs> I, Strike by the iron's hot. Yeah, I messaged him. <laughs> He's <someone>. drunk. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I need, I need to collect as much <laughs> money and information now. Right now. <laughs> wake up like, did I, was I talking to yeah. someone? Yeah. Yeah. Did you give him the link to your Patreon? Yeah. <laughs> he knows where to find it. <laughs> he really wants. So it's and that that only happened because I was being consistently going live. Like it's not gonna talk to me in my DMs just because like you know. So I, I don't know. It it's consistency and you never know. I, I, I do I do live streams with like three to four people on and it is incredibly embarrassing if you care about that. If you care. Yes. But luckily for me, I have absolutely no shame. So it was like you know I've That's been weird. naked on TV more times yeah. than anybody else. Like it doesn't matter to me at that point because I know I'm doing it and and editing like in the end I had a video that I finished at the end of that live stream. So even if nobody was there to watch, like I'm still in the in the green. Like, I, I, I finished a, a, a thing, so I'll, like, dovetail sometimes. Yeah, that's the way I feel, too. You know, that's why I do the live, because a lot of times when I don't do live, I spend so much time just going over and over and over or something that I never even release it or I release it so late that nobody yeah. cares. And so with this, I just do it. I do all the planning up front. I yeah, do the yeah. thing, and then I move on to the next one. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I'm not, I can never go back and worry about that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I, mean? I love that. I like that. That's, that's yeah. so different from the, the process that I follow. Yeah, you're like the and back, the, not the opposite. Not yeah, that's the other side of it, yeah. right? Because yours is when, you're, when you press end, you're mm -hmm. pretty much done. You do a little bit of editing, intro, outro, yeah. and that's it. For me, I film the talking head. Yeah. Then um, I probably will develop a different process over time. But what I tend to do is write the script, film the talking head, identify all the places that need the B-roll to show yeah. I'm talking about a thing rather than just you guys watching me talk about it, yeah. really show it on the screen. And so I'll go back and grab all of those things to support it. And then, you know, I, I, I do the uh, thumbnail last. I should probably do that first to frame you do it first, to frame the focus. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, from what I understand is your, your title and your thumbnail, you guys probably know this, but the, the thumbnail is sort of the thing that grabs the attention. Every time you go to YouTube, it's a different grid of all of these thumbnails based on YouTube knowing your watching habits and the kind of things you like to watch. Yeah. So they show it to a bunch of people. And so if they show your thumbnail to 100 people and 10 people click, YouTube pays attention to that. Oh, that's a 10% click-through rate. That's good for them. Anything better than 3% is good. Yeah. Um, hmm. Anything better than 10, you know, higher is better. But if they click, uh, it's a combination of them looking at the thumbnail and then reading the title. And so if those two things do a good job of setting the expectation for what the video will be, when the person clicks, that is um, just the beginning, <laughs> right? So you, they show the thumbnail, the person clicks. Now if the video they watch is, is great, they'll stick around all the way to the end and that's another signal to YouTube that not only are people clicking on it, but they're watching it. So they'll start sending it to more and more people, which is how you'll get a video that goes, you know, gets like 300 million views over a period of time. Yeah. But the reverse is also true. If, if people, if you show the <laughs> thumbnail and no one clicks it, YouTube's gonna be like, ah, I'm not gonna show that thumbnail because I want people to stay on YouTube as long as possible. If I show them 50 pages of thumbnails and they don't click anything, I need to show them something else. So that's why a lot of folks spend time thinking about the thumbnails because that's what in, yeah. entices people to click. And then if they click on the video, the video has to be good too because that's what's gonna encourage you between both of those things. I think both matter. Yeah. And um, anyway, where, where, what don't look at my about? phone. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The so last matter, thing right? I'll say is that um, yeah, because because my pro uh, content is the other way around. I use the com the comments that people supply me to give me topics to talk about. So I have a hundred topics in the queue. Yeah. That that I'll be you working. Do. I do. Yeah, I have over a hundred. Uh, I probably have more than that if I kept them all, but. Now I'm sort of sifting through which ones. Sometimes are I'm the like, most I gotta give, I gotta give Ivan a topic, so now I don't have to work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. I get questions every day, I'm all sure the time, you do. but That's I prioritize right. the ones that come in as comments yeah. over the, the ones I get in real life. That's so cool. Yeah. Anyway, I'm shutting sure. down. Hey, this was super, <laughs> super fun. Thanks everybody for coming here and doing this panel. Do we have any questions? Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go in the back there, and then we'll go count over there. Yes. Um, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One. I'm wondering if you have tips for getting started, especially on the production side, to make sure that the production value is high for a future filmmaker of America. Oh, and then two, this is really important, Seth, do you consider Heidi Klum's worm an homage to your worm? Mm -hmm. Oh, pretty good question. Uh, yeah. good question. She was kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> she was. Yeah, uh, I'll speak to the first question. Um, filmmaking tips, the one I always give, is pay attention to the sound. Yes. Because you can fix all the other stuff, and all the other stuff is not as bothersome as when you can't hear it or there's some kind of interference with the sound. So make sure that you get really good sound. And if you hire anybody, hire a sound person. Yes. You're going to thank me. Yes. Yes. Thank you, sir. I second that. I second that. And after, after the sound, which uh, is super important, if you're filming on a, we can talk afterwards if, you know, if you'd like These specific tips. But um, after the sound, the next most important thing, even more than the camera, is lighting. Yes. Lighting. Positioning yourself. And um, there are millions of videos out there about lighting. But position yourself so that the brightest source of light is in front of you or off to the side is probably better. So that you get most of your, of your subject illuminated with a little bit of shadow around the edges to make the the image more interesting. We could talk forever about that. Yeah, like you need the, the flood to fill the kicker and you yeah. look better than anyone else. Yeah. And don't ask me about lighting, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> um, but I do want to hear about the Heidi Klum. Do you think it was an homage? Um, I think that she... <laughs> I, I truly don't know what's going on right now because she for sure saw it and she yeah. for sure made the connection, yeah. but she hasn't even tagged me at, at, at all. But I, I'm also in the same category as any comedian who's going to get their stuff taken. I've had 
like SNL referenced certain things that were YouTube videos and like that always bums comedians out but in the end I think you have to be okay with it because that's the world like that's just what happens and I have a million other animals that I could do that she can also steal from me like it's it's not my best thing and it doesn't matter so I, I've just been trying to be very positive online being like letting her know that I know she took my idea <laughs> and that I'm very proud that she did it instead of being like wow Heidi how dare you you're such a piece of trash what a wormy thing to do I, which other people have and I've been like don't don't be so mean because I, I mean she's like not like a friend but she we are very friendly I mean, I saw her like four days ago and we talked wow. in person. Like, I, I saw her the day before she got into the worm costume. Uh, like, it was that close to wow. like human interaction. And then she turned around and I was like, betray. <laughs> <laughs> she was, she was, has gone to a worm fitting maybe even that day. <laughs> and then she stopped and then saw me. She didn't me. even say, I got a surprise. She didn't for say you. anything. Oh, she goes, hi, oh. Seth Lord. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah. but then I'm, in the end, I'm like, this is great. Like, yeah. I've got, I've, I've done seven different shorts from it. Like, That's taking cool. her image and superimposing it on mine. That she took this sexy photo of her coming out of the worm. And so I took my worm <laughs> and pulled my pants down and did a sexy <laughs> photo. Like, you know, edited it so that, you know, nothing it was, was so showing. Good, no, worm. no worm. No worm. <laughs> <laughs> it was just too small we don't know <laughs> the thing is that I was using her content now she used my content so then I used hers and then I was like we're, we're even but I will post every day until she 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 see I guess addresses the fact that right. we were both worms, you heard it, right? both worms. do you have a question Come on. yes I just wanted to learn more about height how it works um, if I'm a content creator and I need help with my social media, what would it cost me? What would be involved? What's that relationship look like? Um, yeah, so Hype's actually been around since, and my boss is going to hate me, since before I was in high school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so Hype's been around since the mid-90s, primarily has worked in the advertising and commercial space. Because believe it or not, the people who make those ads you skip on YouTube also need public relations and marketing. Um, so that's where Hype really got its start. Um, social media came about because it's really part of that same communications. You need to be everywhere, otherwise people will think you're not there at all. Um, which is something I've had to tell clients before. It's if you don't post regularly, people will think you're gone. Um, but when it comes to that, especially with creators, I'd say the big thing would be reach out and talk to us because depending on who you are or what you need, either because again, we work with you know, major, product, like major commercial production companies, our rate might be higher than you can afford because that just is the nature of the business. That doesn't mean we won't talk to you and be like, hey, here's what, uh, what you should be working on and what you should focus on. But on the flip side of that, if you are just sitting there going, I want to just create and focus on creating, sometimes hiring a social media manager can just take a load of that stress away. Um, especially if that person knows the platforms you're focusing on. Um, there's a reason why if people start getting big on YouTube or Instagram or Twitter or anything like that and they need to focus, there's a reason why major companies have teams that handle social media. It's, it's a full-time, multiple-person team per, like, multiple person team responsibility. And like I said, it doesn't matter if you have a million followers or a few thousand, people are going to expect the same level of dedication. But yeah, my thing would be like, there's a contact form somewhere down the page. <laughs> Fill it out. Those emails do actually, if I've set it up properly on the website, those do actually get to me. Yeah. Um, and other people inside. Because the thing too is we've talked to people who have YouTube channels with maybe only a few thousand followers, whether or not we actually have engaged with them as a client, it really depends on their circumstance. But we're always interested in talking to people who create. One of the reasons why Hype exists is to help creators tell their story. So, one more question here? Yeah, um, so I have been, uh, I started out being a blogger in mm -hmm. 2006. 
And um, uh, so everybody, all, all, everybody liked my funny stories and my travel stories and, and things like that. Once again, I tried to fill, I wanted to get followers. Yeah. And, you know, then when, then I would put it, the thing on Facebook and all that. Well, you know, I've just never, I've always had loyal people and people who would say, hey, why didn't you blog this week or something? Now, um, just in the last few months, I thought, okay, I'm going to get on TikTok and I'm going to get on Instagram mm -hmm. along with my Facebook. And I, and I have a, I have three YouTube channels because I kept forgetting what my name was. Now you have to do three times the amount of time. <laughs> right. yeah. 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 And maybe if I combine the three, I might have a hundred people. But anyway. <laughs> Merged them. <laughs> Merchant. So anyway, um, so then I so then I started having this guy that saw me on Joel's you know chat or whatever, and he comes and he goes, you know what? I can get you a hundred thousand. I can do, and you know I kept and he kept kind of hounding me a little bit, and but because TikTok is so deceiving, I don't know how that lady with two babies can have three million thousand followers. It just blows me away. So then I just got pissed, and I said, you know what? I'm over this. I just I'm just over and I have to tell that guy who's having me, just no, I don't want anything because he did give me a few followers, but they were from yeah. third world. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't want the hackers. So anyway, I'm now back to, it's just like whoever is following me is following me. I have Joel, he is, he <laughs> lets me get my, out. I have an outlet for my, but I just She's been great, by the way. <laughs> yeah. She just comes on my show, she does hilarious stuff. She's a comedian from Kansas, just Jay. Follow her, be her sixth follower. Yeah. <laughs> I don't ask for much. <laughs> but anyway, I have to thank Joel for I do have an outlet. He's been a really good mentor, and I'm meeting them for the first time in person. Yay! Yeah. But yeah. anyway, I had to just give up on yeah. worrying about followers, and that has just That's eased. Yeah. honestly not yeah. a bad way to go about it. Um, never pay for followers is kind of my general rule oh, okay. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you're going to see exactly what you experience. It's going to be, if you're lucky, they are fake Americans or oh. Canadians or Europeans and not from wherever, yeah. where it looks like there actually may have been people who followed you or connected with you legitimately. But more often than not, what will happen is someone will buy followers and their follower account will skyrocket. And their engagement stays exactly the same yeah. because it yeah. isn't real. Or worse, because the algorithm is now exactly. adjusting yeah. to your numbers, and then the real people get shielded from your so real it, oh. Exactly. It's interesting, and again, I can talk after. Yeah. But um, it's interesting that if you have a huge follower base and you drop a video, so like I have a friend that has 200,000 subscribers. Whenever she drops a video, within 24 hours, she has 14,000 views. But there are some channels, and you can find them that have like 500,000 subscribers, they drop a video, they get 300 views. YouTube looks at oh. that, and if you, have, if you have a huge following but not much engagement, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna judge you based on the size of your channel. Every video, it, they look at it as an individual thing, so there's no shortcut to developing engagement. It's really about getting better at telling your story, looking at your analytics to see which parts you can kind of do without in your video, posting you know, what you're interested in, and when you do get I, I now have a couple of people that whenever I drop something, they always comment. Mm -hmm. And when you get those few, engage with them, they'll become like your loyal fan base. They'll start telling people about your channel. You'll get organic growth, which is always better. Yeah, always try to build yourself yeah. organic. And YouTube does have a, they have a policy against uh, follow for follow. Some people are like, if you follow me, I'll follow you. If you do that, yeah. um, YouTube can, can ban your channel. You wanna, it's, in, it's in their community guidelines. I also want to just point out the thing about Community is really important. When you're building a YouTube channel, a lot of times you're building a community. And the people become your, and you, so you want to be able to provide that community what they're looking for, but also we help each other out. You know, like Seth Ward and I help each other out. Ivan and, Ivan's been on my show, Seth Ward's been on my show, Jay's been on my show. We have a, a community that supports one another, and I think that's one of the beautiful things that has come out of this, for me at least. Um, so, that no matter how many followers you have, if you build yourself a community that's a healthy community that is supporting one another, that's worth gold. Or to exactly. even build on that, like the fact you guys hadn't met in person until yeah. today, like yeah. community can be built across borders now. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible to find someone to connect with them from anywhere in the world. And 
the big thing I'd say is take your few followers and, like I've just said, engage with the people who engage with yeah. you. Because the more you have engagement that way, the algorithm will notice and start promoting you to more people. So it's the thing with everyone, because the, the dream of the horse, everyone always talks about the idea of going viral. Don't worry so much about going viral. Just know that at some point, once you find a rhythm, you might not know exactly what you did or why that got you going, and trying to figure that out will just drive you mad because the algorithm changes probably monthly anymore, uh, depending on the platform, or in the case of Twitter, probably every five minutes at the moment. <laughs> but like once that happens, it's almost like your community will feed you on its own because they will start saying, hey, you should watch the same. It's going to be that natural organic growth that's going right. to drive you. And I'll tell you, I, I've released 80 videos. Two of them are responsible for more than 90% of the growth on my channel, and they're not the two that I would have picked. Really? Yeah. Interesting. All right, one more question from back here, a yeah. filmmaker. Yeah. I just have to say, uh, for Seth, um, <laughs> is there any other uh, um, inanimate objects you turn into sentient beings? <laughs> <laughs> On my YouTube, we've done, we did like a series, but I love that concept. I love anim anamorphosizing things, so hopefully I'll do everything by the time I die. I'll have, you know, microphone, chair, <laughs> everything. You did a lamp. Pixar lamp, right? Did you do a lamp? No, uh, but Just my buddy watching. Josh did. Josh Sundquist oh, did the Pixar lamp. He's got one leg, so we're a little different. At oh, yeah. <laughs> but you did a dishwasher. I did a dishwasher, I did a... Yeah. You did it where you were hiding behind a tree. That's true, I, yeah, we hid under a lamp, yeah, yeah. The Thanks butterfly, the butterfly was the most... watching my video. The butterfly was horrific. <laughs> also, just, just to say, I think I prefer your uh, warm costume other than Heidi's. Wow! <laughs> Thanks everybody and thanks for coming.